Professor Hi. Hilary Calvert from University College London, thank you for taking part in our roundtable discussion on uh, clinical trial design. Uh, but today I wanted to uh, get you on your own to discuss uh, a couple of things, uh, particularly PARP, because you're seen as yeah. one of the godfathers of PARP. But first of all, tell me um, wh what you're doing at University College London. Uh, well, I, I've moved there about six months ago, and my brief is twofold, really. One is to uh, build up more phase one in translational medicine programs uh, in the UCL Cancer Institute and in the clinical research facility there, which is new and mm -hmm. very well equipped. And the second is, uh, which to me is the most exciting thing, is to uh, link up with the UCL Bioscience, which is some of the best in the world, and see if I can identify and start projects based on uh, drug discovery for cancer on novel bioscience discoveries. That, that sounds terrific. You got funding? We've got to work on the funding for that. We've got funding for the Phase One program and everything. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Well, good luck with it. So uh, I recall the Part One inhibitor story from Cancer Search Campaign when you were in Newcastle, and we spotted immediately that temozolomide CRC drug would have a resistance mechanism which a Part One inhibitor might block, and so on. And you started work on this mm -hmm. what twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. It was something like that. About 1991, so 91. 19 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So tell us what uh, what happened, the story of PARP. Yeah. Well, um, when you move into a new department, normally the person who left takes all the good people with them, and uh, in Newcastle that wasn't entirely the case because one person stayed, and that was Barbara Durkatz, who, as a postdoc, had been the first one to clone what was then known as the PARP gene. Of course, we didn't know there was more than one then. Mm -hmm. And she had data on it chemosensitizing. So when we wanted to set up drug discovery, it, it seemed like an obvious target to do because we had world-class expertise in the lab, which you always need to make a drug discovery program work as an expert on the biology. And nobody else was doing it. And it worked with drugs that we knew about. Now, to be honest, uh, the chemistry went well, and we got good inhibitors relatively soon. But whenever I used to present work on the PARP inhibitors, everybody would sort of have a stony silence, and there wouldn't be any questions. And then somebody would get up and say, it's pretty stupid to try and inhib inhibit a housekeeping enzyme, you know. Um, but, you know, slowly we convinced people and got through, and we had a phase one uh, we were ready for phase one in 1998, but in fact, due to takeovers with Agaron that we were collaborating with at the time, we didn't get to do it until 2002. Um, but of course, uh, and that was pretty successful, but of course the thing that really put spice into the PARP field and got it into the plenary sessions and everything was the discovery that PARP inhibitors are selectively toxic to BRCA mutated cells. And that didn't come till 2005. Yeah. It was discovered simultaneously by uh, Nicola Curtin in our group, who was collaborating with Thomas Halliday in Sheffield, who worked on BRCA cell lines, and by Alan Ashworth in the Institute of Cancer Research in London, who was collaborating with QDOS, who were also making PARP inhibitors because they got the idea from our program, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it was one of these things where two separate groups found it at once. But the great thing about that was it gave plausibility because they both used different models of bracket deficiency, and we both used different chemical classes of PARP inhibitors. So it made it very clear it was a generalized phenomenon. It was due to PARP inhibition, not some off-target effect on the part of the PARP inhibitor. And the, the results are, are gratifying from oral PARP inhibitors and also IV uh, PARP inhibitors? Pretty much all the studies that have been done have shown activity in BRCA-mutated BRCA tumors. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think what's becoming even clearer now, which we suspected a while ago, but is now becoming clear, is that the activity won't be restricted to patients whose tumors are due to BRCA mutation, mm -hmm. because a lot of tumors have deficiencies in homologous recombination that gives them a BRCA-like phenotype and the potential to respond to PARP inhibitors. Could be as much as a third of solid tumors 
have, a, have some kind of role for path inhibitors. That, that's treatment. fascinating, and that's really tantalizing. I mean, there's a, a small paper here on ovary yes. uh, suggesting that uh, in, in BRCA wild patients with ovarian cancer, there are responses Absolutely. to one of the path inhibitors. Absolutely. And yes. that would suit your uh, theory pretty well. Yes. And, and what would you do part with, with your part one inhibitors now, now that you've got an <laughs> agreement, your people realize that uh, mm -hmm. you were talking sense all along? What's the next step for you? Well, I think the, the next step, I think, is to develop combination studies. And, and this is being done on a broad scale because there's nine PARP inhibitors in clinical development now. Uh, so not only do people believe the original story, they want one too. Mm -hmm. um, and there probably will, be, probably will be a few more by next year. Yeah. You're already running into some interesting issues with uh, combinations versus sequencing, uh, giving PARP inhibitors after yeah. things like platinum and so on. How do you think that's going to pan out, or is it just wait and see? I, I think at this point it, we have to confess that clinical medicine is sometimes an empirical science and do the trials to find out. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's another interesting possibility with PARP inhibitors, which when I've mentioned it has been controversial, but I still think it's worth mentioning. And that is that there's a possibility you could use them for chemo prevention in patients who are known to be BRCA carriers, yeah. because they have a very high lifetime chance of getting uh, a tumor. What we know about the synthetic lethal mechanism in BRCA mutations is that the less downstream mutations that have occurred, the better the PARP inhibitor will work. So that if you gave somebody a course of a PARP inhibitor in a prophylactic way, if there were just a few cells that had acquired the first deletion of the second allele of the BRCA, you'd almost certainly take them out. Mm -hmm. And if you repeated that maybe every year or every two or three years, you might prevent them ever yeah. developing a BRCA-related cancer. We, we talked about this at a, a meeting in, um, uh, in Italy, I recall. Yes. The toxicity profile is going to work out okay, do you think, for a chemopreventive uh, study? The I suppose we've already given tamoxifen, and we know that it causes endometrial cancer. Quite. Mm -hmm. um, the, the subjective toxicities and the short-term toxicities of the PARP inhibitors are minimal, or almost, almost nothing. Mm -hmm. um, varies a little bit according to which analog you're using. So the concern would be the potential genotoxicity of giving a PARP inhibitor. Uh, but the argument against that, as you've pointed out, is that we already uh, find it acceptable to give drugs for cancer prevention which are mildly genotoxic, and that the cancer risk in the BRCA carriers is getting on for 100%. Yeah. So some risk of the prevention would be acceptable. Sounds very exciting. Um, look forward to see it panning out. I also look forward to seeing... Uh, a lot of interesting stuff coming out of University College London now. Thanks very much, Hilary. We'll hope so. Thank you.